Welcome, everyone, and thank you for standing by. As a reminder, all lines will remain muted for the duration of today's call until the question and answer portion. At that time, please make sure that your lines are not muted. Press star 1 and record just your name with the prompt to be placed into the queue. This call is being recorded, so if you do have any objections, please disconnect at this time. And I'd like to turn the meeting over to Ms. Margaret Farrell. You may begin. Great. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I wish to welcome everyone to the December Advanced Topics in Implementation Science webinar. Um, our new Associate Director for Implementation Science here at NCI, Dr. David Chambers, sends his regrets. He was called downtown to um, a meeting of the National Cancer Advisory Board and is um, unfortunately unable to um, be with us this afternoon, but I'm sure he'll be catching us on the archive and, and posting his questions. Um, this afternoon, though, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Alice Ammerman, who's Director of, of the Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention at the University of North Carolina's Gilling School of Public Health. We invited Dr. Ammerman to provide her perspective on what new investigators need to know about dissemination and implementation research. Over the past several webinars, we've highlighted a number of topics that speak to the breadth of the implementation science field. However, one unifying question continued to pop up across these various webinars, and that was around the question of funding, the question of getting started, and what is the perspective of people that have been working in the field? What advice would they give to new researchers? So we're very happy to... Um, invite Dr. Ammerman to do this with us because Alice is particularly well positioned to offer this perspective. Her primary research activities include design and testing of innovative clinical and community-based nutrition and physical activity intervention approaches for chronic disease risk reduction in primarily low-income and minority populations. However, she's also interested in methods of research translation and dissemination, and is currently the principal investigator of the Center for Excellence in Training and Research Translation, which is charged with the identification, translation, and dissemination of evidence-based interventions for obesity and cardiovascular disease control and prevention. Dr. Ammerman is no stranger to us at NCI's implementation science team, as she was one of the founding members of the DIRH study section and the original host for our Tyler Training Institute a few years back. We just have a brief word about logistics for today's presentation and then we'll be on our way off. Um, as the operator said, questions are encouraged and there are two ways to ask your questions. You can press star 1 to ask your question on the phone live. You'll be placed in the queue to do that when we open up for questions. Or you can also type your question in the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. You just have to hit Ask to submit the question. You can submit your question at any time, but we'll be opening the session for questions when Alice has finished. So without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to turn the meeting over to Dr. Ammerman. Alice, thank you so much. Well, thank you, and, and thanks to all of you who are joining this conversation, and I do hope it will be one, and I'm really um, interested to hear your questions and thoughts um, after we finish the slides. So, as you can see by the picture here, one of the things that I do a lot of research on is healthy food access and food systems, so that'll be a source of some of my illustrations, like the first one here. So. People often ask about definitions, and I've sort of put together a combination of Wikipedia-type definitions and then just kind of my own thinking and kind of using an underlying agriculture theme since that seems to fit. So when you think of implementation, that's, you know, taking it from paper and actually putting it into action, executing it, really um, making it work, embracing the intervention in the in the field. Um, and then there's, of course, the notion of research to practice, or I think you NCI folks often use research to reality of, you know, taking it. So sometimes we're actually testing an intervention for its implementation potential, and then other times we are um, trying to use what we've learned to make sure that it's implemented well. And then there's a question, and I think you may have addressed this, those of you who have been on some of the other sessions, of fidelity versus adaptation. So we used to talk really only about fidelity and trying to make sure everything 
was implemented exactly as designed, but I think uh, we're coming to realize that context is really critical and, and that in order for something to work in a different environment, and this kind of gets at the translation notion too, that we often have to adapt it to a different culture or region. Um, there's this notion of designing for dissemination and implementation and, and the fact that the better it's designed for implementation, the more likely it will be to be able to be disseminated. And this all requires a, a very kind of deep understanding of, of both your target or intended population, which would include both those who are maybe recipients of an intervention and those who are delivering it. And then the systems and people involved, the providers, if it's policy oriented, what those things are, the policy makers, and then the organizations. Then dissemination, again, with the agricultural theme, if you think about scattering widely as a sowing seed, but what's really critical, as anybody who gardens knows, is that the soil must be very well prepared and the farmer trained well and equipped with the right um, things to till the soil, et cetera. So um, I think Russ Glasgow and others use the term min, minimum intervention needed. So you, you want to make sure you've got uh, what's really going to allow those seeds to grow or the intervention to be implemented. Um, so dissemination works best if you've really attended very carefully to the implementation side because it's going to be um, designed in a way that could be absorbed into the, the broader environment. And um, it implies that you start with something that's evidence-based, and this is a big part of what we'll talk about today. Um, and um, of course, you know, lots of overlap among vocabulary, and in this case, um, translation is certainly something that's um, got a lot of similarities to um, implementation and dissemination. So just sort of broad stroke keys to success. Um, one thing is not to get stuck in the randomized control trial is the only way to go. I think there's more and more acceptance that we need to think beyond that and creatively about study design and measures. When you get into dissemination and implementation, often things are not as tightly controlled as in other settings, and so you have to figure out creative ways to capture that with the metrics. Um, you want to look behind the evidence of evidence-based, and I will get to more of that, but I think sometimes we are so worried about things that are evidence-based in terms of, you know, published in the literature and um, strong uh, impact that we don't think about what the context is and whether um, this thing that showed evidence of success in one setting could actually do the same in others. Um, I think in, in one way we're kind of coming back to value uh, process measures. We, we used to use that kind of disparagingly, like, oh, that's just a process measure. But I think now we recognize these are really critical measures to implementation. Um, but not everybody is up to speed on DNI or dissemination and implementation research. So it's wise to kind of remind reviewers by putting definitions and other things in your um, proposals and also be sure that you're an informed reviewer if you are reviewing um, DNI research. That means you may not be looking for the physiologic outcomes that you look for in other um, types of studies, more efficacy sorts of studies. So um, you want to make sure you know what your um, how you're rating the, the quality of the research. And if you use good dissemination and implementation principles to do good sort of formative community engaged work like one would normally want to do when, you, when you're kind of entering a new domain where you want to understand the lay of the land, then that will really set you up well for good research that will be very relevant um, to follow from that. Say be creative and entrepreneurial. Um, if anybody remembers the um, the Magic School Bus used to be kids' books and TV show. Um, Ms. Frizzle was the teacher, and one of my favorite sayings of hers was, take chances, make mistakes, get messy. So you have to kind of get in there and try things and be uh, creative and, as with all things, have a sense of humor. Um, borrowing from Russ Glasgow here, you may have seen this, if an intervention works and nobody uses it, does it still make an impact? And I think that really kind of captures the essence of what we're trying to do with um, dissemination and implementation. 
So I know it's kind of hard to make this an interactive thing, but you can just do this as kind of in your own mind, and then we can um, talk about it. If you, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to look at choice A and choice B in terms of testing a diabetes intervention. So while you're thinking about that, I think some people have said, well, I think choice A is actually better science, but I know you want me to say choice B. <laughs> so, and that is kind of getting at the fact that choice A is more of our traditional RCT, um, keeping things kind of clean and um, orderly, whereas choice B is getting messier. We've got several different things going on. Some of it's coming closer to something like comparative effectiveness research, where we're comparing things not necessarily to a control group, but trying to get closer to what we can recommend to policymakers. Um, you know, we have way fewer exclusions. Usually, you wouldn't include all clinic participants, but you wouldn't weed out to say someone with diabetes for a study with heart disease, because in a real live clinic setting, you don't do that either. It does tend to weaken your impact because you have, um, you know, such a wide range of people, but in there, um, if it's a clinical setting, you may not see the impact that you would if you had a, you know, a much more defined population, but it, it comes closer to the, to the real world. So another way to look at this, again, uh, borrowing from some of Russ Glasgow's work, the the PCT on the right is, is for pragmatic clinical trials. Um, that's one uh, way of looking at kind of a different version of a randomized controlled trial, but that has um, some of the characteristics of option B that we just talked about. So, and if you can see this funnel idea with the traditional randomized trial, the eligible population is narrowed quite a bit by exclusion criteria. And then you're only getting results of efficacy among a, a defined subset. And with the pragmatic trial, you take most of the comers, so to speak, um, and you don't exclude many. And then you have more of an effectiveness um, finding, but a much broader subset and much more relevant to what um, a usual sort of clinical setting would be. So this is one of Ross's slides of um, bench to bookshelf. This concern, you know, we talked to bench to bedside, and then I like to say bedside to the hood, thinking about which is more the area where I work of, you know, taking um, what we know about what kinds of behavioral things improve um, chronic disease outcomes and implementing them into the community. But what too often happens is this kind of bench to bookshelf. Maybe it gets published in a good journal, but it doesn't get out there to really make a difference in the world. Um, so thinking about this notion of evidence-based, um, those of you who work with practitioners know that the message has really gotten out there that they need to use evidence-based interventions. Not that it always happens, but that's the, the word on the street. Um, and when you're doing DNI work, you also, that's going to be an important thing as well. But there's a lot of ways to define this, and I think we have to be a little careful. It's very important, but sometimes I talk about the tyranny of demands for evidence-based programs and interventions that don't really consider the context, which would be like the original study. Was it designed in this, like the narrow funnel approach, and therefore how um, realistic is it in your setting? And then what is your setting like, and can, um, can you really expect something that's evidence-based from a very different kind of research environment um, be applied in your setting. So lots of things to think about. Um, one of the many cartoons on this, if you can't read it, the, the data don't predict a tsunami with absolute certainty. I say we wait. So um, I think we've had this problem for a while. In fact, years ago, I was asked to give a talk on pediatric obesity. Um, and at that time, there was in interventions, and there was not much out there that would be considered evidence-based. But this was for, I think, a family practice group, and the participants got double CME if the presenters were giving an evidence-based intervention. So you had to submit your um, 
your presentation in advance and then they kind of checked it out and um, I just sort of admitted freely that there was not a lot of evidence yet. Um, but they let me go ahead with it and I guess people didn't get to double up their CMEs. But I think we've learned that even though all the evidence isn't in, usually there's this notion of using the best available evidence rather than the best possible evidence because some things, many things in public health, um, we need to just go ahead and act before we know everything. It's not, I mean, many are very low risk when it comes to lifestyle change, that kind of thing. And then this one, then we've agreed that all the evidence isn't in and that even if all the evidence were in, we still, it still wouldn't be definitive. So that constant quest for, you know, show me the evidence. And then finally, you may have seen this one. Um, this is from a British journal, as you'll see from some of the spelling. Um, Oops. So um, this was an article that said the effectiveness of parachutes has not been subject, subjected to rigorous evaluations by using randomized controlled trials. And then with the dry British humor saying, we think that everyone might benefit if the most radical protagonists of evidence-based medicine organized and participated in a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover trial of the parachute. So, Clearly, those randomized to the control group and not getting a parachute um, would not have a soft landing. So I think you've heard from Larry Green, those of you who have participated in this series, and he just has a good way of capturing the, some of the dilemmas of um, designing for dissemination. So I won't read this all to you, but this top quote just talking about the complexity of um, approaches to childhood obesity, and then he sums it up with where did the field get the idea that evidence of an intervention's efficacy from carefully controlled trials could be generalized as the best practice for widely varied populations and settings. So it may work in one study with one population, but how broadly is that really applicable? And one example I sometimes use when it comes to evidence-based intervention methodology that the, the real, the science of that really initially came, I think, from pharmacologic interventions. And there you have a specific target population with a health concern that's usually pretty definable. Um, intervention may be something as simple as a pill. Um, and it's an implemented in terms of number of times per day, number of pills, and then the outcome is generally a reduction in symptoms. But if you take something like a dietary intervention, um, which I know all too well in terms of how complicated they can be. Um, you often have widely varying health status in the population. There's many, many different intervention possibilities and um, different strategies and, and frequency and doses and that kind of thing. And then the outcomes can range anywhere from physiologic measures to dietary to attitudes and so it gets very messy very quickly in terms of, you know, what what is the evidence. So thinking of a community context, this isn't exactly the right time of year, but um, I put together this slide a while ago now. Those of you who are basketball fans know that UNC Chapel Hill um, is into basketball. And um, March Madness, of course, is in the spring when the championships are coming up or the finals. So this was a game against Michigan State. I think we were number one seed and Michigan State was number nine seed. Um, this is Tyler Hansbro, if you follow that. Um, and so one of the big sayings of March Madness is where any team can beat any other team on any given day. So kind of juxtaposing here where one looks more dominant than the other, and that switch, switches pretty quickly. Um, what happened here is that uh, Michigan almost won, Michigan State, um, and um, it, despite the fact that they were a number nine seed against uh, a number one seed. So think about the contextual factors. This um, was actually after, you know, our, our tribal is Duke, and we had just played them, and this guy, Tyler Hansbro, had gotten his nose broken by a, uh, a little action under the goal, and so he was wearing, for part of the game, one of those face mask things, protective equipment, 
I think one of the coaches got a technical. You know, there's always the question of referee bias. Are you on your home court? Are your parents in the crowd? Nerves, adrenaline associated with playoffs. So if you think about sports, you know, and all the upsets and that kind of thing, it's clear that just because the evidence shows that you're ranked at a certain level, it doesn't mean that that, that performance always goes with that. So you might call this behavioral intervention madness where we say where any given implementation team can achieve strong effect sizes or not in any given environment with any given intervention. So uh, I always hesitate to say, well, that intervention works. We know it works because we know it works. Maybe in one study we don't know if it works everywhere, and context is everything. And some of the things, kind of like the basketball stuff that we don't, that's not included in evidence reviews is I think we all know that if we hire an extremely charismatic and talented interventionist that that goes a huge uh, way in terms of having an effective intervention. But we also know that you're not always going to be able to find that kind of person. And often we are able to pay a little more for a research study than, than happens in the real world, and they have fewer other responsibilities. So there are a lot of issues there. Implementation support, providing parking and child care that might make a big difference in terms of some people's ability to pay attention to the intervention that may not be mentioned in the journal article. Cost is unfortunately mentioned must, much less than it should be. I think we're doing better there, but understanding that it's really important when it comes to dissemination. Of course, variation in patients in terms of socioeconomic status, health, motivation. Is there a site-based champion who, in addition to the charismatic interventionist, who's really kind of opening the doors, or is it somebody who's kind of just letting it happen? Clinic flows, patient wait times, natural economic disasters, we had one big study in blue-collar work sites for women, and they were textile mills. And during the study, they all, many of them closed down and moved overseas. And then a hurricane came in and damaged a lot of the rest. So I know you can't control things when you get to the population level. So this traditional focus on efficacy and internal validity, rather than more effectiveness and external validity, doesn't really account for what you'll probably recognize here as the re-aim framework. So reach, adoption, implementation, maintenance. I'm thinking that most of you have a pretty good understanding of re-aim, so we're not going to go into details. Happy to answer questions on that later. So external validity is a very important part of implementation and dissemination, often neglected by researchers. People like Larry Green and Russ Glasgow, and they've pulled me in a little bit on this, have been trying to work with journal editors to encourage them to really expect articles to address external as well as internal validity. It tends to be less focused on. And as I said, that really helps determine the potential for translation and dissemination. And there's intersecting systems and context. So, you know, you have to think about multi-level programs along with a socio-ecologic model. And then does it provide information for decision makers? Ultimately, a lot of where we're going with some of our research is trying to change policy, but that, as we'll see, is sometimes a challenge. And certainly, practice-based evidence is important, and you'll have probably all heard of Larry Green's famous quote on that. We want more evidence-based practice. We we'll need more practice-based evidence. We really need to learn from the field what is going on and how to interface with that. So when it comes to practitioners and trying to translate research, there are a number of gaps. One is accessibility, like we talked about, the charismatic interventionists. Do they have the resources or can they get someone in the health department to spend the amount of time on the that the research project did in terms of the implementation? How do the practice situations differ? And, you know, I think a lot of times practitioners we work with, when they pull an evidence-based intervention article, they pull an article about an intervention from the literature. They look at it and say, well, how could I ever do this in my setting? It's just way too, you know, resource intensive and tightly controlled. So some of the unintended consequence, and in addition to randomized trials of parachutes, perhaps, of this whole evidence-based intervention care need for researchers is that we're sort of pressured to prove that our intention interventions are efficacious. So we tend to write proposals that are intensive and costly because we don't want to we don't want the reviewers to say, well, this isn't strong enough to have an impact. And there's the tendency, although this is I've seen improve over time, but to say, well, we're going to prove efficacy now and we'll worry about effectiveness or dissemination potential, which sometimes can result in totally impossible interventions to be implemented in the real world later. But we found that the biggest effective size, and I've been on review panels in the past where people say, well, we'll deal with that later. I think now we're really looking at the potential for external validity and dissemination as well. 
But when we don't, or when we do design for dissemination, that tends to mean that we have a less intense intervention, maybe not as glamorous, not as many bells and whistles. And sometimes it's hard to publish papers if you just have a modest effect size. We all know that even negative studies should be published, but it doesn't always happen that way. And if it's not published, it can't be included in evidence reviews. And if it's not included in evidence reviews, then ironically, sometimes we don't have those interventions bubbling up to the top as something that would be good for dissemination. So there's a bit of a vicious cycle going on there. So some of the kind of filter criteria for decisions about designing something that's implementable and disseminatable is those are words, feasibility, always key, and can it be sustained? And again, a lot of this kind of back to the re-aim and what affects in terms of equity. Are there unintended side effects that are problematic? And then what is the acceptability to stakeholders, both those who are implementing and those who are participating? So a little bit on policy and DNI. I often tell my students that policy happens, therefore it's hard to control and study. Sometimes you can make policy happen. Like you might be able to do a policy in one school, but not another but you can't say, you know, San Francisco is going to pass a sugar sweet and beverage tax, but Washington is not. I mean, you that can happen. And if you scramble, you can sometimes study that just kind of opportunistically. And we do have more grantee mechanisms that now have a rapid turnaround time. So when you they're designed to try and capture or things that are in process, but it's often hard to kind of really design a study to capture that well. So one problem is that if we are to inform policy to truly change public health in a major way, policymakers, of course, they don't always rely on evidence, but they do need to make decisions. They do need material they can use to make good decisions. Sometimes they feel that they don't get that from our research or that they don't get that in a timely fashion. So we need to study designs they can, that can inform policy. And this is one reason we're going towards things like comparative effectiveness research and things like that where we're not just comparing to a control group because what does it mean to a policymaker to say something is versus nothing is likely to be better, although not always. But if you can say, okay, we've got these two things, they cost about the same, which one is going to have a better impact? And of course, cost as we consider is part of that. And then we need designs they, that can evaluate these kind of complex policies. Again, this notion that sometimes we have a natural experiment with very little warning, and we often cannot come up with a randomized or control scheme for policy. So, so what do decision makers care about that researchers don't? I'm borrowing from Russ Brownson here now in terms of what he calls the clash of cultures. If you look on the political decision making, let's say you start with identifying a problem up to the right kind of upper right and you don't go necessarily to the evidence right away, but you make a political judgment, you know, what's my base going to think about this? Is this something of concern to them? And then when you make your decision, you build support, maybe related to that, you propose some sort of a policy initiative, assess reaction again, maybe somewhere in there you have some of the data that's available from the scientific circles, but it's a very different process. Whereas we go through this kind of methodological thing of identifying a problem, developing a hypothesis, studying, analyzing the data, publishing the results. And it all makes a lot of sense to us, but where does that interface with the decision makers? In terms of some of the challenges and opportunities, we need to try and find a way to close the gap between what policymakers, planners, practitioners, and communities want to know and what they're getting from our research so they can actually put it to use and make an impact. And I think we already mentioned that some of the editorial tendencies of journals kind of discourage the more external validity type things, but opportunities related to taking this notion of community-based participatory research principles, that's kind of a community engagement or really stakeholder engagement at all levels, to really, we tend not to work with policymakers, even though they could probably really help us understand more about how we could present the data to them in a way that would be more useful and more impactful. Um, so getting a little more specific, let's see if I can go back in terms of how we get funded for DNI research, as was mentioned in the introduction. And I'm on the study section now for dissemination, implementation, research, and health. And this is part of the program announcement. And there are different levels of R01s, R03s, R21s. And, you know, getting at what we've been talking about, that relatively little of our research dollars are spent on how to best ensure that the lessons we learn from research are actually put into practice to try and synthesize that event. 
Again, in the bolded part, we are really looking across the spectrum in terms of all the different stakeholders involved with delivering an intervention to try and understand how that can work and have a bigger impact. This was the basis for a lot of the translational focus with, say, the Clinical Translation Science Awards and that kind of thing to try and get research really out into practice. So one hot tip from working on the panel is that if you say you're proposing implementation or dissemination, be sure that you follow through with the appropriate study design theory measures. It's kind of odd, or it's taking me a while to understand this, but the reality of the study section is that we not just get studies, proposals that are related to the program announcements about DNI, but we get others as well, and we are not allowed to ding them for not being responsive to the DNI RFA. So if you say you're doing DNI, make sure you follow up on it. And clearly there is interest in those kind of proposals, but there are others there as well. And if you if you're not really doing a true dissemination implementation proposal, but it's more efficacy, but then you actually claim that it's dissemination, then that's not going to work. You're doing all of the things that go behind that to kind of demonstrate that. We can talk more about that if it's confusing when we get to questions. To walk through quickly the different sections of a grant proposal, you know, significance we tend to kind of assume is sort of a given. Usually it's not. Usually people don't get any points off for that. Not generally hard to show we have so many important problems. But if you can't show it, then your grant is probably dead. So you really want to make this work. And it's a little trickier with DNI. Usually it's the argument on the importance of the health problem, and you do want to do some of that. But the key argument is why studying the implementation or dissemination is key. And usually that's because the current level or lack of success regarding the uptake of a particular intervention. Let's so often it's the case that we have all of these evidence-based interventions, but nobody is using them. And if you can give specific data to show that problem, then that's something that positions you well for a DNI proposal. And then you went to want to be able to cite if you can do formative work ahead of time as to what some of the specific challenges and barriers are. Then if you can do some modeling as to the potential benefits if implementation is enhanced, like if you have evidence that a certain amount of intervention dose or reaching a certain number of people has an impact, if you can then multiply that up as you scale up for dissemination, that can make a strong case. And you want to make sure to remind people and give the data behind the fact that you are proposing an evidence-based prevention to be scaled up or to be tested further for implementation. So innovation sections, sometimes people find this tricky with DNI because you are starting with an existing intervention. So how is that innovative? Here you want to describe innovative theories or conceptual frameworks that help you design and test the implementation process. Really good formative work is important to really go beyond just the focus group, go to all levels, the practitioners, the participants, the potential family members, if they're going to have a big impact on the individuals. So you really want to understand all of the challenges. And as I mentioned, a broad scope of stakeholders, not just the participants in the program. You also want to think about what are the implications if your study is successful, shall we say, is for policies and regulations that may further increase its impact, or is the timing perfect because a certain policy is being implemented and your work will help show that that can be implemented? Now, the approach section, which is usually the methods, is the place where the most critical scoring usually happens. So you want to spend a lot of time on this. It carries the most weight. Remind the reviewers this is a DNI proposal, so they're not starting to look for the usual sort of physiological outcomes. I mean, that's a possibility, but it should not be expected of a DNI proposal. Remind them that you are working with evidence-based intervention, and again, to not focus necessarily on the physiological outcomes. Describe your theoretical framework, and be sure for any proposal you need to do, don't just say we're using social cognitive theory and then never talk about it again. Show how that's being implemented in terms of your intervention design and your measures. Think very carefully and defend your study design. If you're not using a randomized trial state, this as a proposal choice, explain why. Give the pros and cons. Use the diagram. If the study design is being complicated, I like diagrams or anything, so it's just easier to follow the study design in the review section. Give plenty of attention to measures. Tie it to your conceptual framework, discuss reliability and validity, and often a table of measures is really helpful. And of course, make sure you have a good statistical guidance for analysis sections. And if you are saying that you are doing cost effectiveness, make sure you have somebody who is knowledgeable in that area.
Sometimes just cost data is not good enough. You don't always have to go the whole step. In most cases, you would not be doing a cost-benefit, which gets into the long-term impacts and is very complicated modeling. In terms of investigators, there's not really like an economist or a health behavior person. We don't have people who are DNI trained PhDs. So you have to find a way to mention that someone on your team has this expertise. You can mention it in the personal statement of the biosketch, describe relevant background in terms of this kind of research that's been done in the past, and you can mention things like this webinar that has given you some experience in doing that. Very quick to show you, and just kind of a fun side of things, an implementation approach about using behavioral economics, which is something that people are increasingly interested in, I think is ways to change behavior. This has something we'll call taste texting, which is using technology to improve high school lunch choices. Now, it's interesting how this has evolved over time as federal policies have been implemented. The challenge at the school level is that from a high school perspective, lunch periods are short, lines are long, the period is needed for doing extracurriculars, homework, and healthy is low on the totem pole in terms of most teenagers in high school. For the lunch programs, the school food service perspective, there's an increasing demand for healthy school lunches from parents and others. The new federal standards now are, that are being implemented, you've probably seen some of the news with Michelle Obama, has gotten involved with responding to the kind of pushback for new standards. So really, the school lunches are getting much better because of federal standards, but not all kids are loving it, so to speak, so participation is actually going down. The healthier menu items can be more expensive and harder for the schools to implement on their very tight budget. And when it comes to different school levels, high school is always the lowest participation. Without going into a lot of detail, the school lunch program has to operate like a business. They really often don't get any sort of subsidies. They do get reimbursement from the USDA for kids who qualify for free and reduced meat price meals, but in order to get that reimbursement, the kid has to participate, and then the other kids who are paying for lunch. So really, they need those customers, both those who are free and reduced eligible and those who are buying it. Suddenly, the metric kind of changes from nutrition because it's a bottom line. It's basically more nutritious, although it still has a ways to go, but it's certainly improved. It's moving towards increasing participation, so we can use a behavioral economics to nudge students turning healthy lunch options through the notion of convenience. Now that school lunch is healthier, and with this texting program that we're, I'll explain in just a minute, we only offer the healthy options that can be ordered through a text message, but we don't say that, of course, because that would mean a kiss of death. So we just make it fun and convenient, and it happens to be healthy. Now, the outcome of interest, as I was saying, really becomes more the participation rather than the quality of the food. It's just a basic max text that comes out from the school, and we're in the middle of testing this. I have students doing a dissertation around this. Everybody who signed up for this possibility of the text order gets a prompt that says, it's time to pre-order lo your lunch. You get some options, you get to make some choices. Part of the theory of behavioral economics is that if you pre-order before standing the lines and smelling french fries, you make better choices. The students then text in their lunch options, and they can actually text in a time when they can pick it up as well so they can spread the lines out. And then they pick it up in a separate kiosk where there's not a long lunch line. To them, the benefit is shorter lines, more convenient, and maybe slightly cooler than the normal lunch. So to us, the idea is we're getting more kids to participate, and they're eating pretty healthy options. This study was funded through the Cornell Center for Behavioral Economics. And again, we're incentivizing with convenience and the pre-ordering, so you're less distracted, and this idea of making decisions ahead of time. So quickly on implementation and dissemination challenges, there's all kinds of things in terms of the meal combinations and, and making sure they're qualified for reimbursable meals. How do we define healthy? That seems to be changing target for those of you who think the nutritionists change our minds every other day, negotiating with school food vendors about which menu options to offer setting up a separate kiosk for pickup, not necessarily an easy thing to do, but often the schools have been doing this for a sort of like a la carte thing. And in terms of dissemination, how do you scale this up? The software we put together to test it would have to be redone and ramped up, although possible to do to say handle hundreds of schools. And there's always the question, will all kids have access? Just about all kids have phones now, even lower income kids, but we, you know, want to make sure that everybody has some sort of access. Not everybody has a smartphone. Can this all be sustained without the research infrastructure? That's a key element of dissemination because we so many times, we, when the study ends, the intervention ends because there isn't that support system. Who are the stakeholders? What are their vested interests? 
that might help with the dissemination. So in our case, one of the vendors for the schools, they see this as a prime opportunity to increase their sales, so they're very interested in supporting this endeavor. Parents who see this as an option for their kids to get healthier meals support it. So you want to look beyond the kids and see who else would be supporting. Teachers could have a way of ordering things without having to stand in line with the kids. Lots of different ways. So that was a lot of talking. I'm going to stop now and take questions. Great. Thank you. And thanks so much, Dr. Ammerman. It was a great around the world, I think, in dissemination implementation research for sure this afternoon. But now we'd like to open this, Dr. as Dr. Ammerman said, for any questions that you may have. I know there are a number of you online and on the live meeting, so we'll give you a minute to press star 1 to ask your question live, or you can also type it using the Q&A function at the top of your screen. And while questions are getting into queue, Dr. Ammerman, I should note we have a disgruntled Duke basketball fan who sent in an email earlier, so I'll acknowledge that and move on. But in addition to looking at UNC's chances in the coming year, what do you see as the future in terms of funding for implementation science research? Well, I think that we're moving towards more funding for that, and I think many existing funding sources are expecting you to include a section on dissemination. It used to mean where you are going to publish your results, but I think more and more there's an expectation that you somehow look at how whatever you've been developing and testing could be carried on in the future, and that you have some proposal for how that could happen, even if it's beyond the scope of the immediate project. That means that having skills of dissemination are important for getting funding, even if you're not specifically applying for a DNI grant. Great. And it's kind of building on that. A related question would be, what about community partners who are interested in working more closely with researchers to implement programs? What's the best way for them to get started and become part of the conversation? So community partners who want to initiate something, is that what you mean? Possibly, yes. Well, there are, I'll put in a plug for prevention research centers, since I direct one of those. There are 26 of us around the country, and our kind of, one of our missions is to really be responsive to community partners and try to conduct research that's very relevant to their needs. So you can Google CDC prevention research centers and find the one that's near you and see if you can find somebody who would participate. You know, researchers are always needing community partners to be able to implement. We are trying to implement things without input from people who are really on the ground and really understand the challenges. We probably aren't going to be very successful. It's a real partnership. Great. Thank you. And we have some questions coming in through the live meeting. The first one from Kimberly asks, how does implementation science mesh with quality improvement and techniques and theories? That's the good question. And a lot of people ask that. And there is a lot of similarity. They're both something that happens to happen more real time, especially quality improvement, and sometimes a little bit harder to propose it as a study design because you're usually doing rapid cycle improvement or things like that where you're trying to build on information and improvement over time. We used to kind of say, well, you just have to keep the same intervention throughout, even if you find that it's not really working very well because then you won't know what you're testing. I think we're moving towards more towards this notion of an implementation science and quality of improvement is tweaking over time and trying to end at the place of it with a good quality intervention that has potential for dissemination. It may be a lot harder to characterize it as exactly what the dose was and what the characteristics are that were most effective, but overall the package should be better because you've tweaked it through quality improvement. I hope that helps. Great, no, thank you. Another question from Steve who asks, it seems that DNI research requires a longer period in which to work out the implementation strategies being tested in a study relative to a clinical intervention and efficacy trial. What advice can you give in preparing grants that allow for a period of incubation of the strategies before the trial examining their effectiveness begins? Well, one thing is that it can actually be broken into a couple of studies. And if you're doing a true implementation study, you would be looking in at great depth and, you know, what the challenges are to implementation, taking something that's already been. I mean, you should have something that's already efficacious from other studies that then you're trying to figure out how to be able to implement. So rather than kind of testing implementation and looking at efficacy, you want to start with what would seem to have an impact. And then from there, you're trying to understand what are the challenges and barriers to actually putting it to practice. Feel free to follow up if I didn't quite get to that. Yes, no, I think, and then feel free if you want to continue typing on as a follow-up. And Carol has a question that says, 
are there widely accepted theoretical frameworks other than REACH or REAIM that can be cited for implementation or dissemination studies? Yes, there are in fact is an article that Rachel, I'm blanking on her name, she's a former student of ours who's now at Wash U with Russ Brownson, and they did a review of theories related to dissemination implementation, and they actually identified 60 plus kinds of models and theories that they actually classified whether they were more intervention oriented or more dissemination oriented. I could certainly provide that to Margaret or others if that's the way to get it to you, or I think you could hunt around for Russ Brownson. I think he's the senior author and then kind of review DNI theories. I think you'll be able to track it down. Great, I think it might be Rachel Tayback. Yes, that's it. We'll post that article Dr. Amman suggested on Research to Reality as a follow-up, and that will be a good place for that. And there's a question from Erica that's somewhat related to, can you recommend formative assessments for all DNI research? In what instance can it be overlooked? I'm not sure I'm following it. In terms of can it be overlooked, meaning that you don't need to do it, that you may not need a formative assessment? Well, if you are implementing or disseminating something that's been heavily tested in the population where you're trying to maybe scale it up and spread it more broadly, one would hope that the formative work has been done already for the interventions. But in most cases, they're somewhat different from where it was originally tested and where you're doing it. Formative work doesn't have to be thousands of focus groups and less structured interviews. Sometimes it's, again, talking to the practitioners, going to find out how things there might differ. It's not just about the recipients in the intervention, and it doesn't have to all be published interventions or published qualitative research. Often you can just learn a lot of the process from talking to the people involved and trying to understand what might be unique or different about your situation. Great, and thank you. What fields, Dr. Ammerman, do you feel are, or what topic areas do you feel are kind of primed for DNI research? You're talking about behavioral economics. What else do you see as an up and coming topic or something you'd like to see more research being done around? Well, I think that anything that involves kind of a behavior change related to health and where there are multiple layers and levels along the socio-ecological model of kind of an individual knowledge and behavior, but then surrounding environment, you think of it as concentric circles as a socio-ecologic model, where you're trying to understand that all different levels of the factors that influence whether or not, say, it's adopted by the implementing organization, whether it can be maintained, whether the intervention can be delivered in a way that's relevant to the population that's being served. Great, thank you, and thanks ever so much. We started a discussion that people can continue to participate on researchtoreality.cancer.gov, and we'll have that available. We'll also have an archive of this presentation before the week is out, certainly by next time next week. And we'll look forward to inviting everyone back to join us in January for our next Advanced Topics presentation. So again, we want to thank Dr. Ammerman for being with us this afternoon. And I think this is our largest audience of participants on the topics, Advanced Topics webinar. So we're very thankful to Dr. Ammerman for bringing all of her fans along with her. And thank you, everyone on the line, for joining us this afternoon. And we look forward to continuing the discussion with Dr. Ammerman and with you on Research to Reality. So thank you very much.